in front of a mic. That will be Isa. She studies uh, in music at the Cégep Saint Laurent. She's been at the uh, going to the garage for several years, first as a violinist, and then she became a, a camp counselor. And uh, she's been a mentor. She's been a mentor for three years now. And uh, she's responsible for uh, children's groups. Uh, the group, the age group is no five year five year olds. And sometimes uh, we'll have older uh, groups, but uh, in that in a support capacity. So we're talking about the right to speak, the children's right to speak. Did you have the impression in your life that uh, you were not able to uh, express yourself, you, the impression that you were listened to? Yes, I was listened to, but at a certain age, it is hard to give your point of view because you do not know exactly what you want either. Uh, uh, from what age we know what we want? <laughs> a child knows what he wants. Well, it depends, uh, of course. Uh, uh, to at one at some at a certain age, you realize that school is useful. Yes, some people, some kids never realize that. Yes, so uh, how come that one day you decide to speak to express yourself? What is the uh, necessary ingredient to have the guts to do so? Well, it depends on confidence, self-confidence. Uh, yes, uh, confidence in. Uh, oneself and in other people if we uh, feel that somebody will not be will not be uh, listening to us then it is really useless to speak do you uh, think that it, as a general rule uh, adults listen to children well it depends in what conditions of course uh, I think that in some families yes uh, in other families no but young people are starting to talk about this of course the uh, children I, I meet with every I've been responsible for of course there's a there's more trust and at school uh, young people tell me the children tell me there are 25 children in the classroom and uh, if I have three or four in a group they want to talk to me at the end of the class well I have time to talk to them but in the classroom context it's more difficult and you you uh, live that as a as a, a teacher you're a kind of teacher but with uh, more limited groups what what is the kind of challenge you have uh, to confront uh, are they able to speak well my, in my groups there are only five uh, participants so they're not really uncomfortable and uh, sometimes for example they want to go and and uh, play in the park, and they, I was teaching uh, uh, them a, a scale. I was showing them the scale, the music scale, on the, and said, "Oh, can I go and uh, build a, a castle uh, uh, or eat something?" It happens uh, very often. And how do you react? Well, it's uh, talk about structure with the child and say, well, uh, the class ends in 15 minutes. I would be proud in, uh, if you waited uh, for 15 minutes to do so. So when you have such uh, resistance on the part of the child and when the child expresses uh, his disagreement, you give an explanation to the child? Yes, but it's difficult because you, uh, you can't uh, make everybody pay for the fact that only one child is resisting. For example, if I wanted to uh, play uh, a uh, given to have a, a piece of music with them, and I tell them it's a lot of fun. So in fact, you're, uh, you're doing some marketing of your activities. You say, oh, it's, uh, it's fun. I would be proud. Uh, you were also talking, uh, talking about trust. Uh, how can you build a, a trust? between the adults, since you're an adult now, you're 19 years old, and the children, how to build trust. How is it, are you, how are you able to create that? Well, of course, first of all, it takes time. And how do you find time to build trust? Well, of course, uh, if you see the children regularly, uh, in some cases, it is uh, very quick. They will confine in you very rapidly. 
but the atmosphere is, uh, is, uh, is one where people, the, the children feel safe. You said earlier that the children would talk about their, their family environment. Uh, do you think it all starts in the family, this feeling of trust? Yes, oh, each and every time, because for five year olds, uh, sometimes they're not going to daycare. They really uh, know only their family members, or they go to the uh, daycare center only part-time. So there are different uh, factors that intervene. You heard Ms. Dr. Canaval's presentation, what he was saying. Uh, between the responsibility to uh, educate and the fact that you have to listen to the, to children. How do you react to that? You you can say you don't agree entirely. Well, it was not exactly the same context. In a, an end-of-life uh, context, of course, it's very different from the, uh, uh, the garage uh, environment. Of course, we try to take time, explain uh, to children what they, uh, why they are there, that they have to uh, learn something. So we have, uh, they have, to, of course, to practice bef before they can learn to play an instrument. They have to be calm. So we have to explain to them what to do. Of course, uh, for you listening to the children, it doesn't mean that they can do whatever they want. There's a, uh, they have to be uh, structured. So how do you reconcile that, the right to speak uh, and the need uh, to be uh, structured? How do you reconcile that? Well, it depends on the context. Well, let's say in your context, in the context you're working, the uh, garage à musique uh, or summer camps, or how do you reconcile uh, first the, the framework, the structure, like in society, rules have to be followed, but at the same time, children have to have the right to speak and even sometimes to uh, oppose this uh, or to resist. Well, sometimes uh, there is no concentration in a child, so I try to uh, give them a role as a helper. I tell the child, maybe you don't want to play the music, but I would like you to help us and to, to sing the notes with us. Sometimes it doesn't work either, so we have to find something else. We'll, we just do the, uh, the rhythm or show on the uh, board. Uh, usually it works. I, I use different uh, tricks. Of course, you can uh, propose a different uh, role to the child, a role that is different but is still useful. Yes, if we allow the child to leave the classroom or go elsewhere, then uh, that child will be completely disorganized and it will be uh, really detrimental to the uh, atmosphere in the classroom. So you can do that, even if the group is a group of only five participants. Yeah, what you used adults, you said that adults, uh, we can't do that all, uh, either with adults. They have to be structured also. Thank you very much, Valérie. Please uh, uh, stay with us and you can continue. We can continue the conversation together. Mrs. Siwi Turdel, you're a jurist, a legal expert, and you also are interested in alternative uh, uh, processes of uh, mediation. Uh, you followed this conversation. Uh, you heard uh, Valérie. What uh, do you conclude from this? What uh, could, ye, could be applied to children in general? as a legal expert. First, I'm extremely proud of Valérie. She made real progress as a musician, and uh, uh, she even went to a competition as a violinist in Toronto. And today, uh, she uh, uses her own strength to help other young musicians. So I'm very proud of you, Valérie. And so far as the children's right to speak or the voice of children, we uh, forget very often, as you say, Franco, that adults are interested in knowing 
what their children want. The parent asks the child, what do you want? But very often we, uh, we lose patience. Yes, we lose patience because we don't get an answer. Very often children ask questions and we don't have the answer. So uh, we tend to uh, just ignore them because we're supposed to be stronger than them, to know better than them. But what we realized, and that's we re what we realized in the Garage à Musique and also in the uh, Child Rights Committee since 2008, and uh, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Bureau also had that experience, that sometimes children have answers that we do not have as adults. Uh, they are able, able to change. They're not only moral agents, they're agents of change. How do you, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, children have a perception of life that maybe we, uh, we forgot as an adult. We were all children at, at some point. What, we, what did we lose exactly? We, well, a, an understanding of life uh, among uh, indigenous people, for example, uh, children, uh, we are, they let live, they let children uh, live freely their life. And in the one that, when they're 17 or 18 years old, there are missionaries in the years, sorry, uh, in the, sorry, it was the 17th. Uh, 17th century and 18th century. When the missionaries arrived, uh, they were uh, imp they were really struck by the disorganization among indigenous people. But that was only the missionaries' per perception because their organization was different. And uh, insofar as children are concerned, uh, of course, uh, I, it's been a long time as a child, but um, you can ask a child a question or the child ask a question for us the answer is so obvious that we give the answer and then they say why and we uh, we give the same answer once again and once again the child says why and why and they keep saying why because we haven't looked at the problem in the right perspective and as a uh, an adult as Tatiana said we think we're better equipped than they are but sometimes we're not. And uh, we created this rights committee to listen uh, to uh, children and uh, build that with the uh, adults, but also children in the 9 to 12 group of age, uh, age group. But I think that younger uh, children are have a richer vision. They have another vision of life and also of the services we want to offer them. In what was said earlier is that uh, the benefit from this was to, to listening children was to better understand their needs. So what I hear from you is the same thing, to know what they want. But when you give the right to speak to children, is that all we want to know? Well, in the Rights Committee, Children Rights Committee, children have space to give their opinion on what's happening in society, what's surrounding us, but also larger society, if Anne-Marie wants to give an example and so far as the capacity for change that can bring that children can bring it, many people would be surprised but it it is not so surprising because children have a very specific vision but uh, we have to give them space to let them allow them to uh, communicate that vision and their need to evolve and also the need for a society to evolve to better integrate children. what, How would you uh, qualify that vision? What do we learn from children when they they speak, uh, when they're part of such a committee? That could be surprising for us. Well, first is the vocabulary they use. 
adults very often we use more complicated words uh, that sometimes don't do not mean much and children bring us back to a very simple vocabulary for example at in the child circle there was a researcher i don't know if Anne Marie Pichet is here today she also took part in that assessment session and we uh, use different words in that circle, but it was to explain things to adults, but on the basis of the uh, language used by children to reach adults. So this was a better adapted uh, model for them. For example, if we want children to participate and participate, and lawyers know that also, there's not really space to hear the voice of children directly. Adults are not very comfortable when there are young children around a table because that's it, we want to protect them, but protect them from what? And children want to be part of the decision-making process when it is uh, related to their life. As a parent, of course, if a child make a decision, of course, there'll be an impact on me, but first, but also first on the child himself. So children have their own interests. Uh, it's a bit, I would like to answer everything was said, but the message I really want to uh, transmit here is that we have to create a space so uh, to allow children to be agents of change. They have that capacity when, even when they're only uh, four year old or uh, five year old. So, and their idea is as good as my idea. Uh, how would you uh, react, Doctor, to what was said by Valérie and by Mrs. Siwit Rudel? Dr. Carnival, um, I was really interested in what was said. Do children express only their own desires or other the desires of others also? Well, we tend to think they're uh, self-centered, but uh, if uh, when I talk to a, a young person, when I talk about chemotherapy or, or a surgical intervention, well, the young person always says, well, what will dad or mom say? So they, they have other people in mind also. They're not only uh, angry at me, but they're really aware they have the capacity to visualize uh, the impact on other people. And we also uh, discover that uh, uh, young people can become responsible and really accountable for what they do. Now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Julien, but I would uh, uh, be able to take your questions. If you have questions, we'll have five minutes for this. But Dr. Julien, last words maybe, what would be your reaction and uh, what do you think that, what would be the uh, take home message today? Well, that's kind of complicated. There, that's better. Right. Well, I'm very uh, touched by what we've heard from Valérie because we're very proud of her. She's a real role model for several of our children. The social pediatrics practice that we pursue is a, a, a relationship based on where we listen to children and this uh, relationship with children allows us to build up a relationship of trust 
because first of all we have to get to know them um, make friends with them we love them we think they're great people and that sets the scene for uh, sharing of opinions because if the child is, doesn't uh, trust us we won't be able to do anything but even during this uh, clinical approach there's this question of uh, being clear what do we see in front of the children what do we not see in front of the children and how do we allow their voice to be heard and how do we listen to their understanding and their vision of the world which is different from ours different from an adult's vision often adults say oh he didn't understand anything he's far too young to understand that that's what we hear all the time from adults it's not his place there. They they ask the child to leave the room, and we're talking about things that are directly affecting uh, the uh, children. In fact, in general, we refuse this request from parents because we want the children to listen to what we're saying, because that means that we're uh, uh, opening up their understanding, we're reassuring them. Because often children witness lots of things. For example, they are witnesses to uh, domestic or daily violence. And then, then apparently we have to push them out of the room to talk about uh, the, this with the parents and say it's bad for the children to see these violent acts. But when we say to the parents, uh, well, why don't you go out and calm down or go and smoke a cigarette when you get all worked up, but just get out of the room? Do the adults not perceive this uh, situation as a bit of competition, a power a competition between the uh, two uh, adults uh, as to who's going to take care of the children? No, I think it's more a question of feeling guilty because, in general, the parents are not proud about their behaviour. But when all this is discussed openly in front of the child, then that means we're already starting to repair things and lead to some sort of reconciliation and show consolation because we're continually reassuring the child and we might uh, play with the child while the social worker continues to have a discussion with the parents but we create an atmosphere where the child can express their uh, opinions and that's why I wrote this book about decoding children because they say lots of things not just with the, uh, their words giving them a voice it's not just a question of their of words, it can be gestures, their attitudes, uh, how they move around. <laughs> if we're in a sad situation, for example, and the mother starts uh, crying and we get up and we go to reassure her, then the uh, small child, if he's in extremely insecure, he'll actually push us aside because he wants to be the one to look after his mother rather than us. And there I'm talking about rather complex uh, situations. But we have to really see how they're expressing a thing. We see this even with uh, babies. It, when, when, for example, they've got colic or they're irritable and when they cry all the time, they're very irritable. Often there's something underlying this. There's a message that they're trying to get across. And we have to try and decode this and unlock this message. So uh, being clear means that we can listen to children. And when we're open and we let them listen to the conversation with the adults, then this builds this uh, link of trust. And they think, well, if they haven't said this now, then they might express it when we're examining them on the examina examination table, because that's a very intimate relationship when you put a hand on their uh, uh, stomach. Uh, and you say, there are a lot of people in your house at night. That's when they'll give you the answer, because you've built up this uh, uh, relationship of trust. And it's a very close relationship. So I really think you have to be clear. You have to be open. You have to tame them, if you like. And when they realize that they can trust you and they love you, then they really open their hearts and tell us really what they need and what they want and what their parents need as well. And there was another point I wanted to mention. What was it now? Well, I can draw from what you've said already that in order to get uh, children to speak, it's not just a question of uh, sticking a microphone under their nose. It's not just uh, inviting them to express things. You need to create the right conditions. Now, just a small anecdote about a girl who's about eight or nine years of age now. And uh, she was being looked after by her grandmother, the mother of her father, in fact. And she had very infrequent uh, contacts with her natural mother. And there was a sort of family imbroglio which meant that this child did not really have full access to her family, to summarize things. But she was a marvelous uh, little girl, and we saw her often. We got to know her well. 
even within the context of music as well. And we decided to have organize a circle, a protective circle, to be brief. And she was able to express herself because she's the one that had her, her voice and she was able to take her voice. And we allowed her to really express everything. And everyone came, the mother, the grandmother, the father, they were all there friends and even distant family relatives and she really led the circle the protective circle she was about eight at the time and at the end of the protective circle there was a, a, a moment of total family reconciliation before they were saying mom's not good the the dad's uh, had taken drug or alcohol and the grandmother wanted to hold on to the child because uh, she had always looked after her and she loves her it was very complicated but at the end they signed a sort of agreement with a little girl where they said, well, I want to see my father and my mother and my grandmother, and I want to do this freely. How can you organize that for me? And they did get themselves organized amongst themselves. And it was really touching because they turned to us and they thanked us and little girl. Now, how did she put it again? What did she say? Well, how come that didn't happen before? It was so easy, she said. Something like that. Piece of cake. Thank you very much, Dr. Julien. Now, I won't have time, unfortunately, to take questions from the room because we need to respect our timetable. And I've thought of something we're talking about, giving a voice to young people in this session. And I realized that I think uh, Dr. Julien should have closing remarks, but in fact, it should be Valérie Gauthier. So, Valérie, if you had a message that you want to leave with people, what was important for you in your life or something that's important for the children with whom you work, where you have these interactions, I mean. So what should be a takeaway message in terms of listening to children, giving them a voice? Well, you need to give them access to a certain space where they can speak. In. That's already an improvement. For example, I come from Hochelaga, and in schools we didn't have access to this, and, and in families it's not so great. And if we didn't have the community social paediatric centre, I think there's lots of children that would have to have just internalised a lot of things instead of being able to express them. They need to be given a space for themselves.